Hello and welcome to yet another episode of Hassan Speaks where we discuss interesting topics such as AI, sustainability, leadership, and future of work. I welcome you today, your host, Hassan Habib. Today, we have a very interesting guest among us today. Um, her name is Erin Grover, and she advises on emerging technologies for climate impact and regenerative agriculture. She also advocates for improving the lives of farmers in the global south, inspired by her time with living in, uh, with a farming community in Nepal. Erin has researched the DEFI markets, such as Kenya, Uganda, and India. Uh, she is a member also of the World Economic Forum's Crypto Sustainability Coalition and has spoken to the World Bank, Barclays, and COP28. Previously, she worked in the UN, US aid, and NGOs across geographies for over a decade. That is such a rich experience. Erin, welcome to Hassan Speaks. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Honor is ours. Erin, so you're here today talking about a very crucial subject, sustainability, right? We'll dwell down more into your, your area of expertise uh, and the projects you've been working on. But can you explain what does sustainability mean to you as a person? You know, I have a hard time with that term. And every time I ask somebody, I get a different answer. And for me, I think sustainability, well, I use it so people understand what I do. But sustainability to me is just getting by. I like I want to see the world thrive and that's what I why I do my work and I also like the term regeneration better than sustainability because we're reviving land and communities. That's a very interesting way to take off things actually. I mean we usually when you talk about sustainability all you get in your mind is the green colors and uh, and the blue oceans <laughs> um, and 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 a healthier lifestyle perhaps from a planetary perspective. But looking at it from a from a just going by, just driving by, or just life as usual, that's a very interesting take on it. Yeah, I wanna do more than just sustain, you know? Um, I wanna thrive and be abundant. I like that, <laughs> I like that. So tell us more about your work. Um, of, you know what, let's take a step back. Who is Erin? That's a good question. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, <laughs> I've always had just a no filter approach to life. And I think it's partially um, uh, because, you know, I'm a little bit on the spectrum, which is fine. I embrace it. Um, and I, I wasn't raised to be like this. My parents were afraid to travel. They're afraid of spicy food. <laughs> like, I, I, don't, I don't know, but yeah, I love spicy food. I love traveling. I've been to 50 countries now. Um, um, and I think a part of it was because my grandfather was like, you know, my hero as a child and he always had National Geographic magazines. And I was just so always so excited about those. And then he had a stamp book of stamps from all around the world. Oh, okay. The, the mail stamps. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. I, growing up, I had uh, my own relatives who would collect them as well. And uh, I'm sure they have uh, they've kept those collections till today. Yeah. But stamp collection was used to be a hobby. How does stamp collection um, relate to you? Because I look at these stamps from all around the world and I'm like, wow, I want to go there. Like. <laughs> so that's what inspired you to travel 50 countries? Yeah, stamps and National Geographic. <laughs> and you blended the two then. <laughs> yeah, but I think a part of it was that I also grew up in New York, which is, you know, a great representation of everywhere, right? And, you know, I, I got to have things like falafel as a kid from Egyptian falafel stands in New York. And, you know, you wonder about these people and, and this food and why it's so much better than what I got to eat at home. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll have another episode just about the food with you. <laughs> so from what I understand currently within sustainability, what you're working on is on, is on reversal desertification. Yeah. Right? What is reversal desertification? How would you describe that? So f f for, for our audience, how would you put it into simple, simple words? So, yeah. I, I mean, that word is a mouthful. 
um, desertification, say that three times fast, but I, pretty much it's, it's taking desertified soil, which is dead soil, and it's bringing it back to life. It's, I mean, there are a number of methodologies to do this, which I can get into later, but essentially it's reviving the soil and bringing like carbon, water, and microbiomes back into the top layer. So, okay. so obviously this has a lot of benefits, like being able to farm again and to produce food. Um, it can affect the ambient temperatures of the land, you know, that, that would help, especially in desert, like uh, the Middle East. So is that in the context of desert turning green or is that in the concept, uh, context of green turning to desert and then back to green? Well, um, it's in my work and with the experts that I'm grateful to work with, it's turning desert land that used to be green a long time ago, sometimes a long time ago. Um, I, it, I've done research. The Middle East used to be green. Okay, a long a long time ago. Um, now you've got my attention. Yeah. So my understanding, and I'm, I'm sure there's more to it than this. This is a very boiled down answer. But um, when we got into the Bronze Age and weapons were starting to be made, uh, they're cutting down a lot of trees for the fire. The same thing happened in Iceland. Iceland used to be covered with forest but the Vikings destroyed most of the forest to build their ships okay. for war. <laughs> so war is not green, by the way. But um, from my research, the same thing happened here. A part of it, anyway. Okay. It's, it's so cutting so it down It has trees. a lot to do with, this, with the evolution of civilizations yep. and, and culture. So what you're trying to say, the world was much more greener or has always been green. And we have overused it. Yeah. Yeah. At different points. I mean, you know, outside of the Ice Age, you know. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we've had issues with, we, we have an issue right now with desertification, like with Africa, for example. But right. the, the desert is growing very fast. Yeah. So I get to work with amazing people who are taking the desert back and making sure that we have more farmland than before and just more grasslands and trees to enjoy life. So what would you classify as a main reason for desertification? Well, a, a part of it, I mean, it, it goes to climate change for sure. Um, and you know, there are a lot of reasons behind climate change. Which ultimately then links back to how we live, our, our consumption patterns and, and behaviors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, uh, partially due to our modern life, but, you know, it's also just cutting down forest. So, and cutting down forest happened before our modern life. But I, as a, as a layman, let's say I'm a common man living, going by my life. It may be a very naive question, but why should I be worried about desertification? Well, how does that impact me? How does it impact the community I live in? So the problem uh, on the global scale is uh, well, one of the biggest problems is food security. Um, we're on a track to have about uh, two billion climate, uh, sorry, desertification refugees by 2050, and this is people who are losing their farms. Farms are being lost to desertification every year now. So that's something that doesn't get talked about as much. And, uh, you know, the, the farmland that's being lost is because of industrial farming practices that are not in harmony with the land. And our topsoil, our healthy topsoil for the world, uh, since 1950 has been destroyed. Like half of our, our topsoil has been destroyed since the 1950s. Just in 70 years. Yeah. So um, this is because America started the practices of industrial farming and pesticides. Okay. 
Yeah. And so moving forward, uh, the UN did a global uh, uh, you know, analysis on this that took a while. But about four years ago, they came out with data showing that we have about 50 years, no, sorry, 60 years of healthy soil remaining for the planet. So but let's say, sorry to cut you there, but yeah. let's say if, we, if there is no industrial farming, right, or uh, let's say pesticides are also used for, to keep the crops healthy and, and away from, um, from damage, um, would it be enough to sustain the population of today? I mean, if we did not have an industrial level of farming today. I mean, the, the problem for me and what I've seen with my research and the experts I get to speak with is that if you continue with industrial farming, it will kill the land anyway. One of the problems with industrial farming is that they the way they treat the land, it, it doesn't work. <laughs> and eventually over time, um, farmers in, in, in the industrial sense aren't able to produce as, as much. The yields go down. Um, so just like a lot of diminishing returns. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. What are some staggering statistics you could share with us that could perhaps shed some more light or give a perspective? Well, um, two thirds of the world right now is a desert or going through the process of desertification, two thirds of the world. And I never, I, I didn't know this for most of my life. And in my recent research, I've realized like the usual pictures that we see of the globe for like advertising or school books or whatever, those pictures are actually greener than what the world is now if you get to look at satellite images. And I started to realize this and it's quite disturbing. Um, I, I feel like, and I have a very visual memory, I feel like I remember the maps as a kid looking greener than they actually do right now. So that's really scary to me. And, you know, of course, when I think about the, the statistic of 60 years remaining of healthy soil overall, like that's, that's frightening to me. And it's, it's scarier to me than the climate crisis, which is also disturbing but this but is part of the climate crisis though right it is so that's why i focus all my energy on it because i think to myself every day what's the best thing i can do with my life my energy and my time on this planet that god gave me and i'm only one person but if i can do anything to push the needle a little bit for soil regeneration and the reversal of desertification then i i can die happy and feel like i did something <laughs> So, I'm sure you have much to contribute back to. Um, so we do understand um, the current scenario, right? Where we were in the past, um, and then the awareness st started recently, let's say in, in the current century. Um, and then now we are working towards reversal of what has happened in the past in order to reignite um, the the farmlands and, and uh, grow crops to support the population. Now, in this entire process, let's say the process to getting back to where we were, all right, and uh, I, I say it in a very loose way, I mean, not with a precise timeline, but let's say if you want to go back to that green world that you were talking about, mm -hmm. right? Could you run us through what the process or techniques that mm -hmm. could be applied in order to achieve that Universal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the most successful effort for soil regeneration at scale is from Alan Savory, who set up the Savory Institute. Alan Savory, he's on TED, TED Talks. He's one of the most watched TED Talks, so anybody can learn more about him. But he uses a process called holistic management and has helped to regenerate 39 million hectares of desertified soil around the world on five continents. That's a lot of hectares. So regardless of the location and geographical lo location, it can be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
it can be done anywhere. It can be done here. Uh, I work with another expert in this uh, practice who's helped to regenerate uh, desert land outside of Mecca by an hour. He lived with uh, uh, indigenous people who were, who were nomadic, and he helped them to regenerate their land. So it is possible here. Uh, some would call that perhaps artificially intervening into nature's way, and and it may have long-term perhaps quote-unquote side effects to humanity. What do you have to say to, to, to that perspective? Well, the world's a living being, and it changes all the time, and it's changed over time. So when we look at something, we say it's supposed to be this way. We're forgetting about the past and how long this planet has been here. So that's that's how I I take it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a good perspective. Um, so change is constant. Yeah. Uh, but bringing back what has been, let's say, in the past, right? Yeah. And bringing back that artificially, not necessarily from a natural phenomena taking a course of its own. Do you think that there could be long term impacts? Uh, let's say, um, side effects, again, quote-unquote, to, to this reversal process? Because from what I understand from your, uh, from your conversation is that this is an induced process. Uh, it's not a natural process that is taking place. What kind of... Uh, w would that have any impact? You mean human-induced, not by nature? Correct, yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, honestly... Put it in the context of, like, uh, for example, modified fruit, food that we eat, right? genetically modified. Um, a lot of uh, awareness has been around that, that a lot of people now prefer organic over GMO. Is this the GMOing of the land? I wouldn't say so because, oh, well, I guess, I don't know, with, with GMOs, it's actually destroying the land as well. It, 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 they, they messed up with that too, just like with pesticides. But as far as uh, the practices uh, of, of my team and my advisors, um, it's really hard for me to see it as damaging anything. It's through this process called holistic management, which is the management and rotation of livestock which helps to regenerate the soil. But yeah, I guess I haven't thought about that before. It's really hard to wrap my head around. And when I think about the, compa the comparison to humans and what we're doing just in general with building more civilization and developments and shopping malls, like, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. What do you think about that? So what I would like to know also before perhaps um, anyone could perhaps create a, uh, have a perspective on it. It's, you spoke about Alan Savory, I believe. Yeah. Right? And his work. And you spoke about how he was able to reversal or induce reversal of desertification uh, around the globe in multiple geographic locations. What has been the timeline to that success story to today? Oh, well, Alan's another one that's interesting, I mean, to your original question, but <laughs> he could talk more about this than me, but I'll tell you. Um, so Alan started his journey in the 60s. Okay. So we're not too far into it. So let's say if it was all done in the 60s and today we're entering 24, is it too soon to say that this works or is it uh, enough time to say this does work? For me, I believe it works as far as reducing ambient temperature, definitely. Um, reviving societies that have been experiencing ongoing famine, yes, absolutely works. Uh, and we've seen it with others. Uh, there's one case study that I talk about a lot out of the Loess Plateau in China where they regenerated 35,000 hectares of land and millions of people live on that land millions of people were going through famine and within 10 years of regeneration uh, the society got back to 
farming and going back to school and work. So it's actually a thriving local economy now. Um, so it, it takes a while, but you can get there within 10 years if you're if you have the right people. Um, but it's interesting because with Alan Savory, he thought he was doing the right thing a while back in the 1960s when he was fresh out of college in Zambia because they noticed the grasslands were starting to disappear. And long story short, and you can watch the TED Talk, um, they decided that uh, they had to kill elephants because they thought the elephants were destroying the land. And that's the the guilt and the heartbreak of his life because he was a part of that decision. So it's like intervention into the ecosystem and ecological system. Yeah, they thought the elephants were destroying the land, but um, that wasn't the case. So they stopped killing the elephants, thank God. But that's been a part of his drive in his life because he feels so terrible that he was a part of that. So, but I mean, the, the work that he's done has held over the years and the decades. And, you know, there are families and businesses that now have thriving farmland and business when they didn't have it before. Interesting. So there, there has been some sort of progress. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So how much role, I mean, we are, we are in the age of AI, right? So we always have to touch base on technology. What role does technology have in, in this uh, process? Well, um, as far as holistic management, that doesn't require technology, but technology can be used as a tool to enhance the practice. Holistic management, there's actually, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name, but there is a name in Arabic that's pretty much the same thing for holistic management okay. and rotating the livestock. Um, my friend who did that project outside of Mecca knows the word, but anyway. <laughs> Um, so, you know, that is as old as humankind. We were doing it naturally forever until recently. But what's great about AI, for example, right now, and over the past, I'd say, year, AI has helped to improve satellite data and or the, the combination of AI and satellite can be used to get better soil data and it can help to understand on a micro level what's going on in the soil, what needs to change, what the humidity is. Is it something being practiced currently? As yeah, speak? yeah, absolutely. How, is it, how has it impacted uh, the process? Well, I mean, this is... I mean, what difference has it made? Not with Alan Savory specifically, but... Yeah, I just generally speaking. Yeah, generally about, yeah, speaking. About the process, yeah is helping farmers to make adjustments so their crops can last and and um, they can be productive. Also, it's very interesting because it's helping with farmer insurance. Uh, yeah, okay. so pretty much. Talk about cross-industry impact. Yeah, I mean, but this all gets into finance and investment. I mean, we need good data and, you know, food, food security is our one of our biggest challenges, but in the past and still mostly around the world, farmer insurance is based per province or per state. Um, but now because of the satellite data improving with this combination of AI and satellite, um, the soil readings now, just over the past year, this wasn't possible before and not, most people don't even know about this, but soil data, in this way with satellite is now about 98 to 99% accurate, which does a number of things. But for insurance companies, they're excited about this because, you know, they can get more specific. But you can now zoom into plots to issue farmer insurance. And they're starting this just now in Africa. Farmer insurance has been a challenge and it's been expensive. But when you can zoom in, per plot, there can be cost reduction. And, you know, there, there are micro environments. You can have one area of, I don't know, 100 kilometers and 
many different micro environments. So, so why is somebody an hour away from me who's got more green or who lives by the water and I live inland in the desert? Like I, sh that's different. <laughs> right. So it, it's, it's a huge revolution uh, for farmer insurance. Um, but it's also good for uh, monitoring regenerative soil, what's happening. Um, you can use this combination of the satellite AI and blockchain, okay? We're taking all this data and locking it into blockchain and geotagging it. So we know where the farm is. We know where the product came from. And at each point in the supply chain, we know what's happening because the combination of these technologies and we can look at it down to the soil, right? Wow. We can see if it's really green, if it's what they Invest. say it is. And I'm, I have a lot to say about this, sorry, but um, because of the, the regulations for regenerative supply chains out of Europe, this is very important. Now getting back to holistic management and, and monitoring all this, another benefit from these technologies is that you can also read the carbon in the soil like never before. So in the carbon industry, uh, your, your, your regular carbon developer will say, oh, well, we have satellite data that's 80 to 85% accurate. And that was something they still, they bragged about a year ago and most of them still do because they don't understand what's happening. Um, but that's not good enough, right? So when you have satellite data enhanced by AI and blockchain, it's 98 to 99% accurate. That becomes more of an interesting play for carbon, right? Uh, and there are now insurance companies out there, ju it's just starting, right, that are saying, hey, so, okay, you can prove that carbon's in the ground because of these technologies, and it's, you know, almost 100% accurate. We're going to start insuring those carbon credits. So then you have insured assets, which makes it a tangible asset. So then the carbon market becomes more interesting. Now, most of the carbon market doesn't even know about That's this. That's a direct uh, capital market impact at a global scale. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so. so. Do you think that this uh, creates a case for uh, for more of such projects yeah, to take place? Yeah, absolutely. So if, you, if we take it back to uh, soil regeneration, um, you know, th there's the farming that you can make profit from. And then there's the carbon credits. You're, you're going to have carbon credits from this no matter what. So. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> um, oh, and sorry. I get really excited. <laughs> um, you know, there's also, you, you can apply all these technologies and insurance to coastal areas as well when you're um, planting mangroves, which is another form of regeneration. It's, it's, you know, the coastal regeneration. Yeah, yeah. So. This is good. Now, the perspective that you brought forward when it comes to capital markets and investments and so forth, why do you think the companies should be looking at these industries um, for future investments or, um, you know, investors are considering, let's say, desertification uh, in their ESG assessments? Why do you think that this should be a thing at all? Because we don't have another option if we want to survive on this planet as humans. Like, we need to start investing in these things because we don't have time anymore. But mind you, when uh, an investor is looking at uh, an asset to invest in, first and top most thing is the ROI <laughs> on, on the investment. Do you think that this industry has that? Uh, in, enough beef to, to, uh, to attract the investments in par with its let's say, competitive other investments available? Um, I think it's changing. I think there are more companies and, and funds um, that are creating products that are easier to invest in for the world of traditional finance and investors. But my problem in the day-to-day -day is that you have... Uh, people from traditional finance and then the people out there in the field who are doing the work 
And there are very few people that have their feet in both worlds, but you need people who understand both. So, for example, my... But that could be an area for impact investing, not necessarily for someone, uh, you know, who's looking at just an ROI. And majority of the investors, perhaps, uh, I'm just assuming over here, but perhaps are looking at ROI rather than creating an impact because it wouldn't drive those kind of returns for them. Yeah. Right? They may be responsible in nature, but they're still first priority is, okay, if I put a dollar, I need a dollar twenty back or a dollar ten or a dollar fifty, depending, right? Yeah. So how does that fit into the equation? Because from what you're describing, it, the way I, I'm looking at it now is from an impact perspective, that means if you put money, okay, the money could be burned away. It may not come back, but hey, you've created a positive impact. But how much of that appetite does an investor have? There, there's not enough appetite for it. It's a very challenging conversation. Um, and, and, you know, when you have regenerative projects, it's a, a longer time for a return. These are like, it could be seven to 12 years. So uh, for the year to year, it's, it's very difficult for people who don't have the patience. That's an interesting uh, insight, which usually all, m much of the sustainability sector or ESG uh, sector returns are always longer term. Um, and that is what is understood. Now, can you perhaps provide some examples of companies who are currently involved in these kind of projects and funding these projects, mm -hmm. um, be it on the back of creating an impact or, or generating some sort of return out of this? Um, okay, well, there, for the corporate world, uh, a great example is that you have all these corporations, especially in Europe right now, in America, where they have to start investing in these things and, and not just investing, but they have to have regenerative supply chains. And the longer they wait to get closer to that goal, um, the more at risk they are for having to pay penalties. So the, there are regenerative supply chain regulations that kicked in in Europe this year. And they're going to tighten up these regulations over time. That's the so plan. So something new in 2024. Yeah. So these companies are starting to invest in regenerative projects for a couple of reasons. It's covering their ESG, and they, they have these funds set aside. But also it's to benefit them for their supply chains. There's a great case study um, through Alan Savory's Institute because they provide a market link for regenerative projects. Um, so Ugg Boots put in uh, millions of dollars into, uh, actually, I think it's $4 million into a million hectares of land uh, for regeneration. So Alan Savory's Institute is helping the local farmers to regenerate the land. And this land has 80 sheep farms which Ugg Boots needs for the regenerative supply chain. Oh, okay. That's interesting to me. So when I'm looking at potential investors on the corporate level, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, like, let's think about food and clothing, textiles. It makes your business more sustainable in the process. Yeah. Yeah. And so the Savory Institute does this with the Caring Group, um, New Balance. Like, I think they have at least 200 global corporate partners. So it, it does make money. Right. So is this regeneration or re, let's say regenerative agriculture or uh, de-desertification, if I may say it, is it a component of uh, being measured on, at international level uh, as part of the um, ESG criteria? Or is it something currently not in the mainstream of reportings? So... So Europe's the first to do this. It started this year. America will soon follow. They're working on so it. So we don't have a standardization yet, or standardized no. approach to it. No, but yeah, Europe has started, and it affects 5,000 global corporations that export to Europe. Interesting. And international bodies which 
are dealing with sustainability, let's say, at a global level, are monitoring this and, and uh, measuring this? It's, well, the, the EU is requiring the measurements and um, the, the requirements, uh, if I'm understanding your question right, like they're not required by any other international bodies yet. To report on. Yeah, it's just the EU for now, but that will change. So then I think my next question would be, if, it's, if there's no standardized approach in measuring this, all right, how having a, uh, let's say, uh, regenerative value chain mm. or, or so, um, how does that impact greater ESG goals or sustainability goals at a global level? Um, because I would assume so. If there is an impact and it's being measured, then it, it should have been there. But if it's not... As you say, there's no standardized approach or standardized reporting on this. Then, is there an impact on sustainab sustainability goals at a global level? I mean, we all are. Most of the countries today, many countries, I'd rather say, have a net zero plan, right? Be 2045, 20, 2050, 2060, 70, and so forth. But many countries are following that path in order to get to net zero. So, how does this play a role into sustainability goals? At a greater level. Well, in theory, it's a, it supposed to affect the world um, because of all the products that fit into this category, right? So with the EU, it's not everything, but they started out with like coffee and cacao, and um, I don't know the full list, but it's not everything yet. But coffee yeah. and cacao are big ones, so. Um, in theory, if this is done the right way, then um, we should have more sustainability within Africa for a start and anywhere else that's exporting coffee, like South America, for example. But uh, with climate change and net zero, we're, we're not meeting our goals. <laughs> and, you know, it seems like with all the talk but with all with with since COP twenty seven and and forward and COP twenty eight yeah. as well, and then now we have COP twenty nine coming also uh, later this year. I think there is seriousness and acceleration to this process. I believe so. I hope so. And my challenge is, I have a hard time believing anything. <laughs> That's why I like so blockchain. Now I'm trying to marry technology and sustainability here, right? Mm. You spoke uh, well about how the blend of two is actually augmenting the impact and, let's say, being a technology as a catalyst towards sustainability or sustainable mm -hmm. living. What do you think from, from, a, from a tech perspective or innovation perspective? How, what kind of advances or innovations do you foresee coming in the future that would help the reversal of desertification or uh, I would perhaps call it de -desert -desert desertification mm -hmm. over the coming, let's say, um, next uh, 10 years, next decade? I mean, from but my understanding of what I've seen so far, it could help to expedite the process and make it faster and make sure that it really takes hold, um, especially because you can get so granular now with AI. So, so AI will play a key role. Yeah, and we can use AI now to also uh, just read the land and what trees are there, what kind of trees are there, if they're really there, you know? So, um, you know, that's a, a, you know, another piece of this puzzle is, um, is forestation and uh, you know yeah I hear a lot of companies else that are still complaining because they invested you know hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in reforestation and then they find out later that it didn't really happen and some other corporation got the same exact photo sent th to them in an email so AI can you can now use AI to track these things 
would you share some of your personal experience with a particular perhaps uh, project or uh, uh, de desertification initiative that you've been involved in um, or reforestation? How could audience relate to that and if you could share some of your experience? Okay. My experience with reforestation started with my friends in Kenya. They were um, reforesting with mangrove trees. So I was helping them to package what they're doing and to make it something that could be invested in by you know, traditional investors. That, that's a lot of what I do is I help these people out in the field um, who are oftentimes younger, like I see myself in them <laughs> when I was running around the world in my 20s, like working in crazy places around Asia especially. But so, yeah, I was helping them to package it in a way that investors could find it interesting to help expand their work. But also at the same time, we were granted the leasing rights for a piece of land in Kenya that's about a million hectares. And so I was helping my friends to also package that. Um, looking this was the produce from the farms? or. Um, yeah, the, the, the goal was to uh, set up pretty much debt finance uh, to bring in the liquidity to regenerate the land, to, to support the farmers, and to also develop carbon credits for the future. Wow. So, but... So you hit a lot of birds with one stone. Yeah, that's why I like regeneration. It's, it's an intersection and, and then it's community prosperity because you're a, the region that we were working on this in has ongoing famine. So if you want a prosperous society, your people have to eat and have water and they need to get water from their homes and not have to walk for water every day. So it, it all ties in. In a lot of places, including, uh, you know, especially in the eastern part of the world, a lot of societies and communities are, are looking towards a more sustainable way of living or at, at least aspiring to, uh, to head there. So how would you see, how would you suggest that individuals and communities get involved in such initiatives to support it, um, which, which leads towards more sustainable living? How, how do you see, suggest that happens? Well, I'm glad you say communities because it has to come from the community. So that's that's something that a lot of people don't understand. Um, so with the Savory Institute, they've set up hubs all around the world. They train local people okay. how, how to regenerate their own land. That's, that's what happened in China too, right? So a part of it is getting access to the education um, because not everybody understands what it means, right? Um, so a regeneration has a few components, but a big part of it is making sure there are the perennial grasses mm -hmm. that come back and protect the soil. But yeah, not everybody knows this. And yeah, they need the education. They don't always have access to the resources. So are there any current projects, um, ongoing projects that perhaps international communities or people living in different places can be part of in one way or the other? Uh, or perhaps go even research about these projects to learn more? Yeah, so one is the Savory Institute, but also there's a film called Kiss the Ground that was the first educational documentary to go big about soil regeneration. And that's what hooked me. And I've met regenerative farmers who've said the same thing when they saw that film. That's when they wanted to go from industrial to regenerative. So, so you come again with that name? Kiss the ground. Yep. The ground. It was made in the States. Okay. How old is that? Is it uh, available any on any OTT platforms or so? Yeah, Watch? it's on it's on Netflix and I think they have kissthegroundcom Okay. But uh we watched online as well. Yeah. But um yeah, it's very educational and that was my wake up call. I was feeling very frustrated with the carbon industry 
And then I watch Kiss the Ground and I'm like, okay, like I'm focusing on regeneration. Carbon's in the background. Carbon's a byproduct of soil regeneration. So why not? Wonderful. That's really um, insightful. And Kiss the Ground, go watch this documentary today. Now, question to you now. What is your vision of the future in terms of um, achieving progress in regenerative agriculture, soil regeneration, uh, de-desertification? Um, how do you foresee this and what would be your vision of sustainability? Of what that looks like yeah. or how we get there? Both. So. <laughs> One is the destination you want to get to. Yeah. And then the journey. Yeah. To to there. Yeah. So I see a world full of locally thriving economies. I see a world where there will be trade in the future, but I see a world where we will have to be more locally based, which I think is a very good thing in a number of ways. Um, economically, I mean, even, even for the micro biome of your own body, it's better to eat local food from the local soil. Um, but how we get there, um, right now we need to get there fast and we can. I didn't believe it before, by the way. I thought, mm, we're not going to survive. I didn't think we were going to survive as a human race until I wrapped my head around soil regeneration. And that gives me hope, right? Um, but it's going to take large scale implementation from governments and global organizations. It does give a hope, right? So we do understand over the past years and decades and perhaps centuries, uh, there has been an, a climate impact. There's no two opinion on that. But the hope that this could be reversed is a huge thing for a human element to it. Yeah. That okay, not all is lost, it can still be done. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, the journey to that could be slower than coming from there, but it's doable. Yeah. But with collective efforts. Yeah, it's absolutely doable. And we have the experts. We don't have enough hands. Like we don't have enough people to go out there and do this. And I think in the future, over the coming decades, we'll need more and more uh, people who work in environmental services. Um, so, which is great. I mean, who doesn't love working outside in nature? Like, I don't know. I know it's hard to be a farmer, but I love being outside. Like, I don't want to be working on a computer for the rest of my life. But... <laughs> um, You're going the opposite. Yeah, I'm going to go have wave. a farm. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to take some large-scale kind of top-down implementation uh, as far as, you know funding and resources, regulations, but it still has to come from the ground up. It's not something we can just throw money at or technology at. Communities have to be educated and they have to come together. It has to be demand driven. But this is this is the beautiful thing. Like this is a world of this world that I see is a world of peace because people have to come together and love their neighbor to do this. Like where a part of this ecosystem. It's a collective effort at the end of the day. I mean, an individual can make only so much different, but if you come together as communities and societies, I think the impact can be exponential here. So, wonderful. Last few words for our audience and listeners. What would they be? Uh, um, <laughs> I guess I in my own struggles of my work, this is really hard work because it's like, like, is this really going to work out? You know, and I, I have a really big heart and I'm trying to marry this to finance, you know, it's hard. And I, like I said, I just didn't believe that we could survive after looking at the numbers of everything researching over the past 20 years. But once I found soil regeneration and understood how quickly it can happen and at the scale it can, that's when I finally thought, yes, like we can save ourselves and it keeps me going now. And I don't find myself being 
depressed about the state of the world as much as I did before. I'm not saying it's easy, but I, I think that it's very important. And it's a very important thing to talk about because most people don't understand it. So I hope that anything, if anything that people can take away from this uh, conversation, I just, I want them to know that this is possible at scale within years, not 50 years, not 100 years. These regenerative projects start to yield within a couple of years. That's pretty quick, pretty fast. Yep. But um, w they usually need about five to 10 years to know that it's really holding and that it will stay. Yeah. yeah. But you could start seeing the, the, the impact in a couple of years. Very interesting. Great. With that, thank you very much for being on our show today. Thank you. And uh, I appreciate your presence and sharing us, sharing your insights with us. And uh, should the listeners want to find you, where can they find you? LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> LinkedIn, Erin Grover. Yep. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> I think uh, there will be many connecting with you. It's a, it's a very interesting topic and, uh, and very much uh, on the uh, surface at the moment as well. With that, uh, thank you very much for listening to us today. And I hope today's topic was beneficial and there was much learning as well as curiosity that was provoked. Please do get in touch. Um, Erin Grover, our guest today, please do add her on LinkedIn. And uh, thank you very much. With that, Hassan Habib, over and out. <laughs>